Today on the future of everything, the future of innovation in medical technology. When we think about innovation and invention in healthcare, there are a few things we immediately start thinking about. New drugs, new pills, injections that are going to treat, hopefully cure our diseases. We may think about new ways to deliver healthcare, like having clinics at Walmart or having MDs who are available 24 hours a day, seven days a week on their cell phone uh, if, you know, if you pay them a little bit of extra money. And you also think about new devices that may diagnose or treat disease or ameliorate its symptoms. These may be little small devices like a Band-Aid or a disposable puffer to deliver drugs by inhalation, or they may be more substantial devices like a new imaging method, MRI, CT scans, or a pacemaker, or a deep brain electrical stimulator for pain, and many, many others. Well, where do these inventions come from? And where do these innovations come from? Are they always some sort of aha moment where an innovator says, is just sitting around and says, you know, an apple falls on his head or whatever happened to Newton. <laughs> and next thing you know, we have this great new innovation. Or do they, do they come from careful thought, analysis, and problem solving? Who, who are these inventors? Are they patients? Are they physicians? Are they just really clever engineers um, who had an idea? How does this work? And for all of these uh, innovations that succeed, of course, there are many innovations that turn out not to be so innovative and, and fail. They may not actually work. They may cost too much or not be covered by insurance in a way that makes them inaccessible. Patients and physicians may not like them for some reason, or they may solve a problem that nobody cares about. Um, Paul Yock is a professor of bioengineering, medicine, and mechanical engineering at Stanford University. Paul is a cardiologist who has made major contributions, not only through his inventions themselves, but also through the creation of programs, educational programs, at Stanford, but also globally, for training innovators in what I would call a disciplined process of innovation that tries, um, and these are my words, not his, to reduce the role of luck in the process. Paul, it sounds like you may not be a fan of that aha moment, uh, but instead believe that new inventions come from more systematic analyses. So tell me about that. Well, so uh, that was a beautiful summary, first of all. <laughs> the, um, and and uh, I'll say uh, there are a few people out there who have those aha moments, uh, uh, you know, uh, congenitally. They're, they're brilliant. Uh, for the rest of us, there, <laughs> there is a process uh, that you can learn, you can train, you can perfect. Uh, and that's what we try to do with, with our young engineers and physicians. Now, is this innovation process, do you believe, a general innovation process, or are there features of it that are actually peculiar to medicine and, and healthcare? It's both. So uh, our core religion is generalizable. That core religion is you have to start by understanding the need for the invention very well. In healthcare, that's a really complicated situation because we have all of these stakeholders, and you were alluding to this, right? You have the patients and the physicians, but they're hospitals, regulators like the FDA, insurance companies, and so on and so on. So in that landscape, it's absolutely essential to slow down. Don't, don't do premature invention. Uh, right. you, you have to really dig deep with the stakeholders and understand it. That's the, the whole mantra for our program is that a well-characterized need is the DNA of a great invention. Okay, so that, that's great. And I know that you have this program and I want to talk about it. But before we do that, let me ask you about the inventions that you've been on the front lines of. Mm -hmm. and, and, and there's been many, so maybe you just pick one or two. Tell me how those happened and if they are examples of this process or that if in some ways perhaps they weren't examples, but they made you realize how the process had to be invented. Well, let's see. So uh, one I'll talk about is now called the Rapid Exchange Angioplasty and Stending System. Right. So, so that's a lot of words, yeah. which many people might not know what that means. So, so please. So, so, so what it means is, uh, uh, first of all, angioplasty and stending is a way of fixing coronary arteries that have narrowings with catheters. Okay. Stents are little metal lattices that we put in to prop open the arteries. Okay. When I started early in the field of angioplasty, that procedure, that catheter procedure, took two people 
to do. Uh, there, there was somebody who had to maneuver a guide wire to find the right place, and then the second person had to put the catheter over it. Is this one of those situations where you're going in through an artery in the leg and you're snaking it all the way up into the heart? That's exactly so, right. Okay. So, And trying uh, to stick devices in there. Yes. Up in the heart. Yes, exactly. Okay. Uh, thread them into the, into the arteries. So uh, that, that the way it started out in the early days was very awkward. And I was on the most awkward side of doing that procedure. I was the trainee and I was the one who would get yelled at for doing the wrong thing because the equipment was, you know, klutzy. Okay. So uh, I designed a new system that allowed one person to control both the guide wire and, and the catheter, uh, sped up the procedure, made it easier, and ultimately that took over and that's now the way people do the procedure. So it was a, it was a streamlining and simplification and presumably therefore you would get less side effects from the uh, length of the procedure, maybe even less infections or miscommunications during the procedure. And Certainly I, and, that. And since it's popular, I, I would infer that most of those benefits or some of them did accrue. They, they did and uh, uh, also making it one person made it cheaper to right. do the procedure. So, so and again, before we go to the, how you extract principles from that experience, I know just from uh, from our experience together that you've also been involved in a, a strain reducing patch. Yeah. And could you tell us the story of how that, I, I wanna have these stories as we talk about the, the more general approach so people can ground it in these yeah. stories. So that's a good example of uh, surfing off of a scientific discovery. So Jeff Gertner in the lab here at Stanford uh, understood from his studies of wound healing that uh, if you stress a wound more in healing, the scar is bigger. He guessed- What does stress mean? Stress means, uh, think about tugging on the wound. So okay. if, if you cut yourself, the sides of that wound want to pull away from each other. That's, that's stress okay. on the wound. Okay. So he, he made the leap of saying, huh, I know this. Uh, I wonder if relieving the stress will have the opposite effect, that it will decrease the scarring, and did a number of studies that showed that convincingly. It was, uh, I got involved, it, it was not a huge Socratic leap to say, ah, let's make a device that ratchets the stress back to zero, kind of like in the womb. So, so fetuses, you may know this, heal without scarring because they're in a, in a stress-free uh, physical stress in multiple senses of the word. <laughs> okay, so oh, I did not know. So there's a connection. This is the future of everything. I'm Russ Altman. I'm speaking with Dr. Paul Yock right now about stress reduction in wounds. So, so please continue. So he had this idea, uh, and it was more of a research finding that yes. stress mattered. But it kind of lends itself to maybe we should build some device to reduce stress, to um, presumably to reduce disfigurement uh, in the healing process of a big of a big cut or a big wound. Exactly right. And and uh, there are a couple of other uh, folks involved, Dr. Stauskart and Longacre. But anyway, fast forward. This is now a uh, a, um, a basically a fancy bandage. Uh, that you place on a wound that gathers in the skin around the wound, gets it to a zero stress uh, oh. state. And it really is the first uh, convincing technology. There's all kinds of stuff out there on wound healing. Th this one actually works. And I would guess that you know there is a medical condition called keloid where they have over healing of their wounds. And this might be a, a uh, promising for them to kind of get reduced amount of scarring at the site of the wound. That's exactly right. Okay. Okay. So now we have these real world examples of things that were brought brought into. Um, how do you extract from those some insight about how to repeat this process of innovation so you can present it to young people in training who want to do things like this, uh, but perhaps don't know where to start? So, so a couple of key principles. That, that last example I mentioned that th there were several people involved. We do everything in interdisciplinary teams. Uh, with health technology, there is no one mind that, that can encompass all of that. So we purposely put together teams of engineers and physicians. That's one principle. Second, you won't be surprised to hear that we spend a lot of time on needs finding. So, you know, th this is an old principle. Necessity is the mother of, an, of yes, invention. So, so we just think you should spend more time with mother. Uh, okay. You know, that, that you really have to have a 
stepwise, careful, diligent approach to understanding the need from every dimension in healthcare. That means looking at it from the different stakeholders' perspective, not just the patient, not just the doc. Is an insurance company ever going to pay for this? Is the FDA going to take 10 years to approve it? So we do all of that up front of the invention. We, we dig around and uh, we actually look at multiple possible needs. So each of our teams will look at 200 or more needs in an area of medicine. Do they identify those needs or do you give them a list? They identify them. So, so we, when they come to us uh, at the beginning of the academic year, we send them off into the hospital and we say, don't come back <laughs> until you have this list of Oh, so you need needs. 200. And yep. they, it's kind of one of these like you get a lot of ideas and you throw out the bad ones. Exactly right. It's a brainstorming process. It's just need storming instead of brainstorming. I, it, it reminds me, um, you may know this, but uh, Linus Pauling, who won several Nobel Prizes, was once asked how he had so many good ideas. And his answer was, I just have a lot of ideas and I throw out all the bad ones. That, and so it sounds exactly like this right. is the principle. Now, let me ask uh, about that process. So you could imagine that in a hospital, the physicians would feel comfortable. This is their, their, their grazing grounds. And they might think that they know what's needed. Uh, and then you could imagine an engineer who feels a little bit out of place, maybe a, an, even an, insurance, an insurer who, who pay, who's from an insurance company might not actually feel comfortable in the actual hospital. So how do you make sure that all voices in these uh, teams are heard? And it's not like dominated by an overconfident doctor who's saying, this is what we need to do. So, this so is a real need. You're <laughs> onto something really important, and, and the trick we use is we cross the physicians on our team over into a different specialty area. Uh -huh. uh, so uh, they're, they're looking at something with fresh eyes. They're, they're more innovative because of that. Right. And then uh, we, we insist uh, on these being flat teams from a hierarchical standpoint, right? So, and we have various ways. We, we actually have a psychologist in the program who deals with these kind of team dynamics. Yes, uh, huge deal, yep. huge deal. Yep. It's part of human life and, and it can make a team either more functional or less functional depending on how the dynamics. Okay, so now they have 200 ideas. They're allowed to come back because you told them don't come back without the witch's broom, which is 200 ideas. And we know that a lot of those ideas are bad ideas and yes. maybe, hopefully, a few of them are great ideas. What is the process from at that point? Yeah. So uh, first of all, just to be clear, the psychology here, young inventors – fall in love with needs too easily. Uh -huh. And so what you do is you give them too many needs and, and you force them to compete. And that allows the, them- The ideas the or ideas. the needs, yeah, not, exactly. not the people. Not the people, <laughs> sorry. Uh, so uh, what they do is with successively deeper passes into the area, uh, they will eliminate the worst needs. It's easy to eliminate the first 50, not too hard to eliminate the next 50. Then it starts- to get a little dicier, and what you do by virtue of arguing about which needs are going to get eliminated, you learn more uh, about the need. You go off, research it more, and uh, we are looking. Uh, this is a little bit of detail, but at this stage, we're just looking at how important the need is, how many patients are affected. Uh, if you had an innovation, what would the impact be? We're postponing the harder filters like intellectual property mm -hmm. and regulatory pathway. So anyway. But that's great because you just gave me five criteria that these teams will be debating in their meetings. Exactly. Uh, and you said the first three are, are the ones that you re recommend that they do up front. Right. Like market impact. Is, is this going to save five lives, five million, 50 million? Exactly. Um, this is the future of everything. I'm Russ Altman. I'm speaking with Dr. Paul Yock about turning innovation uh, – frankly, into a science as opposed to an art. Um, okay, so um, this is great because now we had the 200. We have a, it sounds like a very tough um, uh, discussion, debate, yes. extra extra information finding to try to get the team to come to some consensus, consensus. Do you try them to get them to one? Is it possible that it's zero out of 200? So how do you manage the, this later phase as it starts to get tough yeah. and, there, and there starts to be a... a a few. And, and, and I'm interested because what this means is none of those uh, team members may be an expert in the areas that are uh, – so this is not that the plastic surgeon comes up with the plastic surgery Correct. idea. And that seems to uh, 
be a, a, a counterintuitive observation. Yeah. But they have talked to a lot of plastic surgeons right. in their process, right? So this is a get out of the building, talk to all of these stakeholders. In the observation period, you're listening to what the physicians say, but you're also watching uh, and observing where they're having trouble, uh, where they're saying, we do this because it's the way we've always done it. That, that, might, <laughs> be a, that might be a real red light. <laughs> right, exactly. So anyway, to answer your question, we target down to three or four of the best needs to, to input into the next stage of the process. Okay, so I'm, I'm all ears. Next stage. Next stage, you go back out broad again. So for each of those three or four needs, we ask the teams to design at least two better three different, fundamentally different approaches to each of those needs. So okay? this is solution finding. This is solution first step finding towards now. This is finally, this is five months into our year. They're finally brainstorming. And they, and, they and might defending. have thought they were going to do this on day one. Right. So, so if they have an idea, uh, they, they park it uh, and they don't get to the real brainstorming until this okay. later process. And so that – blows out again into, you know, three to four times two to three, right? So you've got a, a dozen-ish ideas out there. Now you bring the hard filters in, the hard filters being intellectual property. Is there a patent room to take this forward? So the idea there is maybe somebody patented this idea or something close to it, and it would be dangerous to try to pursue this in a business or, or in any way because you're stepping on somebody else's intellectual toes. Exactly. It, it won't get to patients because it's not going to get through uh, so that's the, a big the business. One. And by the way, just to comment on that for a sec, this is a different innovation process than companies practice. Companies look at intellectual property really early on, and we have a strong belief that that's a chilling factor for innovation. If, if you turn to the patents right up front, it, you yep. just get psyched out. So you might be discouraged, and it also might focus your thinking into that area where the patents are, and you never even think of those other two or three ideas that are crazy but just may work. Exactly right. Okay. So hard filters, intellectual property, the, the regulatory pathway, is this going to take 10 years for this one idea to prove versus this other one can take a year uh, and, and we can get it patient care faster. Reimbursement. Is there uh, in our system existing reimbursement for this problem that we can slot into? Or are we going to have to spend years and years with CMS convincing them to create a new reimbursement pathway? And CMS is the federal government payer for Medicare, Medicaid. Thank you. Yeah. Yep. Okay, so now you this is why you're calling them the, the, the tough issues is because this could be a great idea, but there could be these showstoppers of just to review intellectual property, uh, the whether anybody will pay for it in the current yes. payment system. And the third one was the regulatory pathway, getting the FDA or whoever gets to decide whether this is safe and maybe efficacious. And, and then there's a, the business model, too. Right. So is this is this. If it's an expensive capital equipment, a $3 million thingy, right. uh, you may not want to pursue that as opposed to a disposable that's just easier to get funded. This is the future of everything. I'm Russ Altman. More with Dr. Paul Yock about innovation in healthcare next on Sirius XM Insight 121. Welcome back to the future of everything. I'm Russ Altman. I'm speaking with Dr. Paul Yock about innovation in Healthcare and Paul, one of the obvious things to compare healthcare to is the information technology business. Facebook, Google, Twitter. There's a lot of people out there mm -hmm. who are trying to innovate. We've seen a blossoming of innovation. Yeah. And when you read about this, you hear that they have uh, strategies such as um, fail fast mm -hmm. or, or fake it till you make it, where you build something and then you get it better and better and better, and that's how you win market share in the hearts and minds of both your customers and your investors. How does that relate to your business? Is that is the fail fast mantra a good one in healthcare? This is a really important thing to understand. So, uh, the the short answer is no. Uh, for uh, most healthcare technologies, you have a pathway of uh, clinical testing and regulatory approval that is long and expensive, and by the way, has the potential to harm patients. Uh, you have to get it right at the needs stage. You, you have to understand as closely as you can what that final product's going to be. There's no such thing as a minimal viable product in, right. in healthcare. So um, it's, it's an essential difference, and 
it's interesting. We've seen a lot of roadkill for <laughs> folks trying to bring, bring the tech innovation process into healthcare. And, and, and to you, having done this and seen this and taught it, it's kind of on its face uh, riddled with problems. And, and, and so it's unlikely to work, it sounds like, uh, because of these multifactorial evaluations and the, their patients' lives. Uh, exactly. On, and so if you know Facebook goes down for 24 hours, it's regrettable, but it doesn't no, – few people will die. Exactly. Um, so – but – at the same time, there are indeed these uh, mobile health, digital health um, technologies that are starting to be introduced. So as you know very well, uh, Apple's last uh, watch has an EKG. You're a cardiologist. Yeah. Has an EKG, which I believe the American Cardiology Association, I believe their president came up next to Tim Cook and waved to the audience and said, yeah, this is great. Um, so we're starting to see this tech culture and the culture that you come from uh, meet each other and start to do things of potential significance. So what is your take on digital health and how it relates to the process that you've been working on for, for many years? A R- really complicated topic, and, and digital health spans a lot of different uh, technologies. But let's talk about uh, one area you were alluding to, and that is sort of the uh, consumerization, the mo- moving of health technologies to, to the home for yes. monitoring, for early detection, for health preservation. Incredibly powerful trend. As, as you know as a physician, that the hardest thing uh, to get uh, for, for uh, success in healthcare is compliance of patients, whether it's taking drugs or, or taking your blood pressure. Or, that is the huge promise of uh, the shift of digital technologies uh, into the home, that, that uh, both uh, consumers have information uh, and there are ways of motivating them. Yeah, a certain sense of empowerment that might make them take control. And if they feel like they're in control, they might actually do what we recommend in terms of the healthcare intervention. Exactly right. I'm not sure the degree to which that's been proven, but it remains an intriguing hypothesis. Yeah. So, so is the needs – so now you just – in the last segment, you described this very rational process, 200 needs, a filtering process. How well will that transfer to um, – home monitoring or a watch that has an EKG? Is it the same process or are you are you and your colleagues looking at, do we have to modify this in light of these new trends? Yeah, so there's a, there's a blend going on. If you're talking about purely an app uh, for health, then a minimal viable product approach works. You, work. you, you still need to understand the needs of the patient, but, but you can put it out there and not do uh, harm and see what happens. So uh, there's there are whole other categories of, of devices, however, where, where you need to be a little more uh, careful, mobile digital devices. What, what might those, what are the areas that make you worried? Uh, so uh, we are increasingly uh, implanting devices or wearing devices that are signaling health information mm-hmm. into the cloud for analysis. So uh, one of the projects that came out of our program is a thing called the Zio patch. Zio. Z-I-O. And what this is is a smart bandage that uh, records your heart with uh, uh, more accuracy than a, than a watch. Oh yeah, this can. is that little white thing my yeah. wife was wearing yes. a couple of months ago. Yeah, exactly right. So that was from some of our students uh, who did that, and the the issue is you have to be really uh, aware of what it's going to take from an AI uh, standpoint to make an accurate diagnosis, because you're short circuiting uh, the the cardiologist specialist uh, right. in that to do that in large scale. This is the future of everything. I'm Russ Altman. I'm speaking with Paul Yock right now about digital health and uh, these new devices that are more focused towards the consumer, more focused towards AI and the cloud, just two phrases that you used. And and you actually made a, a very, uh, you might say, scary reference to the fact that we're taking a cardiologist uh, out of the loop of making a diagnosis of potentially a heart arrhythmia or some other heart problem. So that is a huge, um, that's a huge little comment that you just made there. So what do we do about this? Uh, uh, are the cardiologists excited about these kinds of devices or are they worried? Uh, are they embracing? How, how do so, we think about so this? So this is a good example, I think, of the right way to keep the cardiologists in the loop in the right cases. 
So what happens is there there's a machine reading. Uh, it it does go to a cardiologist uh, to, to double check, but it's done in a these uh, you've you've seen these analyses from the old way of doing it, yeah. which is is you know a half a foot of papers that a cardiologist has to go through. Right, right. Now they get a summary tracings report. of the heart for the last two weeks. Please check it out and make sure there was nothing scary that happened in the last two weeks. Exactly. And that, you know, took an hour to, right. to go through. And so, all the human fatigue. And yep. the, the cardiologist gets distracted for a minute and misses, misses the key moment or whatever. So, so now the, the, the central analysis uh, uh, sends this to the cardiologist. And uh, there's either a report that it's, it's normal and it, it shows convincingly that it's normal that you can see in the matter of a minute. Hmm. Or it presents to you those problematic areas of the tracing, its diagnosis of it, but but uh, sometimes there are subtleties that right. that the machine doesn't get right. So that layering right. of efficiency from the machine, then subtlety uh, nuance from the cardiologist is, is it's it's a very nice theme because the theme you've just described is kind of like uh, augmenting, assisting the cardiologist, but not fundamentally replacing them and l- allowing them to use their high, highly honed skills on precisely those critical parts of the tracing, rather than looking at the ninety nine percent that's routine and might actually bore and and reduce their level of of performance by just distracting them. Exactly. Okay, so so that's a model that might work. Um, so a- as you go through, um, what is t- let's talk about healthcare costs, um, and and let's talk about the global setting. So my understanding is that um, uh, the U.S. is I think disproportionately responsible for a lot of novel technologies. It is, but we also have disproportionately high healthcare costs. Are those part and parcel of the same thing? Should I think about that's just the cost of doing business in the U.S. is having expensive health care? Or do you see opportunities for us to continue to be leaders in creating uh, technologies that benefit patients, uh, but that there is some hope for getting costs under control? So uh, really important topic. Short answer is uh, we are inventing now in a different way. We are inventing doing economic needs finding as well as clinical needs finding. So that becomes one of your criteria. Bingo. Uh, and there is endless room for taking costs out of the system using technology. And we were just talking about an example of it. So, so that Zeopatch is documented to save hundreds of dollars per patient per year uh, for atrial fibrillation patients, people with a, a funny rhythm. Great. So there is hope. There, so, and I love it. I love your answer, which is that you've you've created this process. If you want um, a cost to be a component, just get those teams to use that as a filter of those two hundred it, it, ideas. It's, it's just a design constraint, and design constraints stimulate creativity. Thank you for listening to the future of everything. I'm Russ Altman. If you missed any of this episode, listen anytime on demand with the SiriusXM app.